Doug. Hi, Gracie. Thank you so much for coming today. Thanks for having me. This We're is looking wonderful. forward to the conversation. I'm happy to be here. This is really nice. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. I was hoping we could start when you were in our shoes, when you were just starting out on your career. Your first job out of business school was as an analyst at American Airlines. Correct. You moved around between a couple different airline companies after that, but never left the industry. What drew you to that first job at American and to the airline industry? Um, yeah, I'm, you're, you're going to test my memory. It's a long time ago. <laughs> um, but no, I, I um, a lot of people in industry um, you will, I, I, that I, you will find it, it, you know, just grew up you know, with jet fuel in their veins and <laughs> sit and watch airplanes take off, uh, you know, when they were 12 years old at the airport. I didn't do any of that stuff. I was not um, a huge commercial aviation enthusiast or anything like it. I, I, was, uh, I was looking for a job. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd gone straight through um, from undergrad to graduate school. Uh, my concentration was in finance. I wanted to go somewhere where finance was important. Mm -hmm. So I looked toward, tar I looked toward cap heavily capitalized industries. Um, and airlines popped up. So um, as did a number of others. So it wasn't so much the airlines. I, and I was fortunate enough that at the time American Airlines was building a, uh, trying to build a hub in Nashville, Tennessee, where I was, um, where I was getting my MBA. So uh, they came to campus. I interviewed. And um, they invited me back to Dallas. I liked people there. It really was as simple as that. It was, um, I knew I wanted to go somewhere where, where what I was, where what I was, um, reasonably proficient at mattered. Yeah. Um, so that was as targeted as I did, though. It was, and it was, and then it was just. But having done it, it's. I, I, I loved it. It's a fantastic business. It's really dynamic. Um, so that's kind of why I stayed in it, I think. But it was. It wasn't anything more scientific than that. That makes sense. And and but you did stay in the industry. And many of us, many of our generation are job hoppers. A lot of us, our next jobs, we won't be there for more than a couple of years. What's your advice as someone who stayed in the same industry for so long to people who are thinking about jumping between companies and industries over the course of their careers? Well, um, yeah, again, I mean, it's, it, 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 all I know is what, what I did, so it's hard to, to suggest that that's the only way to do it, because it's not. Um, but you know, I, I, what happened with me, again, is I, I got into this business. I found I really enjoyed it. Um, what I, what, I, what I like about the airline industry, what the airline business um, is that all the disciplines are really important. I said I wanted to go somewhere mm -hmm. finance mattered, but finance does matter, but so does, you know, it's a, it's a, um, a consumer product, so marketing is incredibly important. It's, there's no more complex operation in the world, so logistics is uh, incredibly important and valued. Uh, the the uh, maintenance function is really a manufacturing function. Um, so every discipline is really important, um, and how you make all those things come together is really important. So what you know, what I liked about it is the ability to, to gravitate to different um, items, uh, areas over time. Um, you know, so but so much staying in the industry. I don't know. I I I know at times there were, you know, I I, I contemplated doing other things. It wasn't that I that I think oh no, I need to stay in this business for mm -hmm. any for any reason. It's just the opportunities that came around were in or continue to be in the same business. Now I don't think I can do anything else. Is all I've done. <laughs> um, but um, you know, so I, I don't know. So I, I will say. Um, that uh, it's certainly nice when we bring in people from the outside um, because you you can you bring in a fresh perspective and people in our business tend to you know have uh, hold on to some views of the past that maybe we don't want them to hold on to anymore. So there's always some value in bringing people in from the outside, but there's also a tremendous amount of value of having people who have been in the business and know it and have seen the cycles and, and understand. So I, I think either way we we need some of each, mm -hmm. uh, but. Um, there, there certainly is. If, if, you, if we if we find someone who's just moving around, it's just in for a couple of years and out. It's, it's not particularly helpful to us mm. um, because it's just it, it takes longer than that to really figure out what's going on. And when you when you first arrived at this company that has so many different disciplines that are important, you hadn't been watching the planes take off when you were a kid, right. and there's a lot of value from the industry expertise. Just starting out, how did you make a name for yourself in a company like that? Um, yeah, you show up and do your job, and um, you know, try and uh, make sure that uh, you're you're being responsive to what people are to what the organization is looking for. I wasn't again. I don't think I was. Um, 
you know, I wasn't this you know, incredibly hard driving cutthroat, I'm gonna make sure that I get this job before someone else does, but I certainly cared about what I did. I took it seriously um, mm -hmm. and I worked really hard. I, I, I took pride in, in the work that I did and people noticed that. Yeah. And so it wasn't so much you know, that I was gonna figure out how I got to this job by this time, um, but rather I showed up and did the job that I was asked to do. I think I did it pretty well and people recognized that and they want you to do more things. Um, and, 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 and of course then, you know, what really matters is, is as, you, as you start moving up in an organization, the skills that might have been really helpful as an analyst are not particularly the ones that are, uh, the ones that are as important as a manager. Um, so you gotta figure out how to adapt and do those things. But, but um, anyway, I, I tried to do uh, what I was asked to do and I, I took it really seriously. I worked, I worked pretty hard. Um, uh, because I, because it mattered to me. Mm -hmm. So, and, but if you do that, people people will find you. Yeah. Were there any key people or key events that that helped you, in, especially when you were moving up into new positions where maybe you didn't have the skills yet? Yeah. Well, you know what I, what I remember um, from back then, uh, where my career really started to progress a little faster, uh, is when I was promoted. I, I was. I was a pretty good analyst, but there were there were definitely better analysts than me. Um, smarter, this is like good at Lotus one two three or whatever the hell we <laughs> used back then. Um, so um, yeah, so anyway, they, they could they could build a spreadsheet faster, and they so I, I, I was I was pretty good, but definitely not the best. Um, where my career started um, progressing is when I was promoted to, you know, managing a small group of people, and um, I've always liked working in teams. Uh, I was a, Played team sports growing up. That's what I, you know, I that was I was comfortable in that environment, and uh, I quickly realized that you know I can if I can just get these five people who are smarter than me um, to work together, we can do a lot more than the six of us can independently. Um, and that's and, and I was and, and I did find that, that I anyway I, I think I did that role better uh, than certainly my peers at the time. I, our, our team was able to produce more. Um, I tried to make sure they all got credit so then people wanted to be on my team. Um, and as a result, that's when things you know, started taking off for me a little more. Interesting. A lot of these dynamics are the dynamics of a more traditional, complex company that's been around for a while and has its hierarchies. A lot of us are looking at jobs in Silicon Valley where we move fast and break things, right. which isn't necessarily how I would describe American Airlines. <laughs> so give us the other perspective. What can we learn at this point in our careers from an established company that we couldn't learn at a startup? Um, yeah, look, I, I, um, well, that's, that's, a, that's a hard question for me to answer. Again, back, back when I came out, um, you know, there wasn't an internet and there weren't people, you know, the best and brightest didn't go work at startups, they went and worked at um, established firms, um, so it's what I knew. Um, but 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 look, the basic principles I, I I'm certain are the same. Um, that is, you know, leadership skills, uh, getting people to work as a unit, communicating with people uh, in a way that they understand what the mission of the organization is, um, in a way that they that they feel motivated to produce. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's how you that's how you're successful in a large organization. I can't imagine that's how you're not how you're successful in a smaller organization. Um, and look, this this yeah, the large organization stuff. Well, it may sound old and stodgy. Um, you know, we I think the reason um, our team has done uh, as well as we have, you know, given the cards we were handed anyway, um, is because I think we think much more like. Um, a startup, that startup mentality. You know, we took risks others wouldn't take. We did things people thought were crazy, um, and there's so much value to be created if you're willing to do that yeah. in large organizations, because the organization um, doesn't. Um, it, it will reward the behavior, but it, but it doesn't encourage the behavior. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if if uh, anyway, any of any of you, um, if asked, you know, look, this is a, I'll give you a. You roll a dice, and you know if, if it comes up six, I'll give you fifty dollars. But it comes up, if it doesn't come up six, you know you got to pay me five. We're all gonna say, well, of course, you know that's you're gonna be ten to one odds on something that's one and six. If you try and do that, and if you mention that to your boss in a large organization, I got this idea. Um, he's gonna the boss will say, wait a second, you're telling me five out of six times I'm gonna it's not gonna work. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna look bad five out of six times. We're not doing that. Um, so. But those of us who are willing to say, what do you do? I don't care. It's a great bet. We're going to do, do that. Yeah. Um, do extremely well. 
um, because the risk reward relationship works, of course, like it does everywhere else, and you're in an environment where risk is less encouraged. So those, so, so the reward is is much higher than it would be if everyone was actually taking the same level of risk uh, or had the same attitude. So, look, I, I, you know, again, I only know what I only know what I've been through, um, but. You know, I don't feel like it's been, you know, boring and stodgy. It's been incredibly dynamic and exciting, and the fun part is is taking these risks and seeing uh, and when others don't, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, having some things that others would look at and think, oh God, that didn't work for you. Which we say, well, we, it's exactly what we thought was. Gonna, I mean, we, I would never, I, I would do the exact same thing again yeah. because it was the right decision. Uh, just because it didn't, just because it came up two, doesn't mean it was the wrong decision to take that bet. Mm -hmm. um, it was the per it was the right decision. So, um, and as long as you keep doing those things, particularly in an organization where you're not competing with a lot of people who are doing the same thing, um, you can do really well. And is this perspective you've developed about you know being willing to take the risk? Has this developed and changed over your career? Oh, I don't think so. I, really? I, 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 yeah, I, I don't know. I used to like going to Vegas a lot when I was younger. <laughs> um, so. And uh, you know, look, I, 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 I've, um, I'm a big proponent of, of risk taking, and always yeah. have been. So, and, and it, like I say, it's, it's helped me a lot. And um, you know, things like you know, just in the um, uh, in the introduction of you know my career when I left, it's, this is inside airline stuff. So sorry, but you know, back when I left American Airlines in uh, whatever that was, 1991. You know, all, everyone, American Airlines, that was that was the place to be if you're, you know, that we hired 40 MBAs a year, and we were the best and the brightest, and no one went to work for Northwest Airlines, for God's sakes, mm -hmm. um, from American, but I did, um, yeah. because, because, because I could do a lot more at Northwest than I could at American. Um, so, you know, I, so I've been, anyway, that's, that's, I would encourage people, you know, to go take risks, and um, it, it's, it, I, I've, that's what I've been doing for a long time. Good, since the Vegas days. Exactly. But, but combined with your risk-taking style, there's also a lot out there who say you have a leadership style that's very humble, very confident, but very humble. And the airline industry has a lot of folks with some pretty big egos. We've got confidence. Yes, yes, every, everyone's got the confidence, but the, the humility, I think, is a distinctive feature. Is this, or what are the trade-offs between the two different styles when you're running such a complex organization, so many different people to communicate with, as you expressed before? Okay, well, thanks for the characterization. I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I appreciate that. I hope it's true. Um, <laughs> what, what I know is um, that this is, a, this is a huge team sport, mm -hmm. and there's no individual that makes a difference, and the way it makes a difference is if you get the whole team pulling together and working together. So... Um, I'm stunned sometimes to see how some individuals try and you know position themselves um, um, because I, because I can't imagine what it's like to work for that person when you're the one doing all the work and they're taking all the credit. Yeah. So I try not to do that. I, I and, it, and it, it's hard by the way because people want to do that. Um, the you know the media only wants to talk to me um, and um, so and and they and they and, and, and it and everyone wants to try and simplify it into you made this decision you made this decision and I didn't make those decisions somebody else made this decision I was just I, was, I said okay mm -hmm. um, so um, at any rate so I, it's, it's not it's not um, I don't think it's a conscious attempt to try and be different than anybody it's just who we are and what we've learned long ago is, you know, if we all work as a team and stick together as a team, we can do really good things. But if we all, if any one of us tries to make it about us, then it starts to fall apart. So that's worked for us. Um, I don't, other ways work for other people. That's just what works for us. Yeah. Building on that, the, the airline industry is one that invokes a lot of negative sentiment among customers sometimes. You know, the Wall really? Street Journal. <laughs> I've, I've heard it mentioned. Yeah, the Wall you. Street Journal recently published the, a report showing that American Airlines was ranked last in sort of overall ranking of U.S. airlines for, for 2015. I didn't read that one. <laughs> I'll send it to you. I'm sure it's wrong. Uh, probably, probably, just to slip up. Maybe okay. I was looking at it upside down. But... <laughs> That happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I want to know is in a team sport, and you're the team captain, right. and there's results like this, how do you lead the team? Well, you understand the results mm -hmm. um, and make sure. It, it, look, I did read the article, and you didn't read it upside down. Um, the, uh, 
it, but look, those, those are we're in the middle of an integration during the yeah. time that was that, that was measured. So things like what they measured are important. Mm -hmm. um, but um, some of the things they measure are really hard to do when you're when you're running two separate airlines, um, like baggage connections. Um, you know, yeah. we, you know, when when we've got people connecting from U.S. Airways to American Airlines, and you know, it's, it's harder. So that that all that we're well aware of that. That's the problem of integration, and we are that stuff's fixed. So we won't be last next year. Um, American Airlines is one airline now, and uh, we'll get the we'll, so. That, so anyway, first and foremost, that's the answer. But to your to your brought to that specific set of circumstances. But I'm not about to suggest, oh, we do everything great. It's a great business, and people shouldn't complain. Um, it's it's a it's a difficult um, it's a difficult uh, function uh, to transport people, you know, through bad weather like we're about to have in the, in the East Coast. Um, and people pay a lot for the for the product. And there's and there, and look if we do everything perfectly, if we do our jobs perfectly well, that you know, it's, the aircraft's perfectly maintained. Everyone shows up on time. Everyone does their job exactly as they should. The best we're going to do in terms of on-time performance um, over the course of a year, anyway, is probably around 85 percent. Mm -hmm. um, 85 percent of the time, we can guarantee you, you should expect at the in the very very best run airline. Uh, that you're going to arrive within, four, uh, and by the way, the definition of on time is within 14 minutes of your scheduled arrival time, um, which is nice too. Um, <laughs> that's our government. Um, but nonetheless, so that's, um, that's, so, you know, what other business, you know, has 15% failure rates yeah. uh, that, you know, and for a product, but that's entirely due to weather. That's, you know, in, in the example I just gave, there's no maintenance cancellations. Yeah. That's, that we 15% of our flights get delayed because of weather. So we have, the, we have this challenge of a product that, you know, is a means to an end. Most people don't buy airline tickets to fly around on an airplane. They're trying to get somewhere else. Um, and is also, um, because, because of how complicated it is and how capital intensive it is, it's reasonably expensive. Uh, so they expect it to work as a means to an end, and when it doesn't, they get upset. Uh, our challenge is to make sure that we manage that as well, you know, and, that, and we're getting much better at this. When things do go wrong, make sure that we were, were able to respond much more quickly and get people where they need to go, and because and, um, people do understand weather, uh, but they still want to get where they, where they were trying to go. So anyway, um, I've, I've already forgotten what the question was, Gracie, but uh, we, we work really hard at doing, um, in, a difficult, in a difficult job, mm -hmm. um, to do it really well and, and to focus on customers. We have a phenomenal team of people. We got over 100,000 employees who, who are just out there doing a great job every day. It's a re really noble thing they do. Um, they get beat up sometimes because they're the ones standing there when the, when the plane can't go. Um, but the reality is, you know, those people are, um, we make com they, they make commerce run. Uh, you know, business couldn't operate without the airline industry. They, they get people to go see other people. They get people to go see the world. Um, and it all happens because of the work they do, and we're really proud of it. Um, but we, what we know, we have to get better uh, at at at, at, um, at accommodating, reaccommodating people when things go wrong. Yeah. And related to things beyond your control, ten days after you became CEO of U.S. Airways, you woke up to the news that two planes had crashed into the World Trade Center. What went through your head at that moment, and what did you do that morning? Um, yeah, I was I was in Phoenix at the time, working for America West Airlines, um, and uh, yeah, I was the CEO for ten days. Um, it was a nice ten days, and then uh, all relative. So um, look, the immediate concern, of course, was for the safety of our of our um, of our team. So um, you know, quickly after learning about about the flights in the World Trade Center, uh, my phone rang and it was, you know, the, the FAA was grounding the entire commercial airline fleet. Um, and so we were putting airplanes down. So the best message I got was, you know, hearing that every one of our airplanes was safe and all, they were on the ground. So, yeah, but anyway, then it quickly turns into, you know, the next three days of trying, you know, shutting down the airspace and those things. But not much longer once once you get past the immediate safety concerns, and, and by the way, extreme empathy for those who didn't have their employees safe at American United. Um, but you, shortly thereafter, um, we moved into what are we going to do about the long-term viability of this business, and, this, and particularly the company that I was running, which is America West Airlines. Um, we, uh, we, uh, we had arranged a financing um, with uh, some suppliers of ours, Airbus and GE, to help get us through what was already a tough time. Mm -hmm. um, it was uh, arranged, um, but we had not, not 
fully executed. So that, of course, fell through. Uh, we found ourselves in a position where we absolutely, in that environment, did not enough, have enough cash to make it through the winter. We were going to go, and in that environment, since there was no way, uh, even in a through, a through a bankruptcy filing, to expect things that would, like dip loans that would allow you to survive, we were, we were going to shut the company down. We were going we were to we were going to liquidate without some sort of capital infusion. So, and the only possible uh, way to get a capital infusion in that environment was the U.S. government. Uh, they, they established this government loan guarantee program. So, I went from when I took the job uh, in September of of uh, 2001. Uh, the one thing I remember telling the board is, "Look, I know how to, I can do all this stuff. You know, I've done I've done operations. I've done." I've done the marketing side. I've done the finance side. Uh, the only thing I really haven't done is government affairs, but that's OK, because we're this little airline in Phoenix, and we never have to do anything with Washington, really. It's more the bigger airlines mess with that. Well, I, was, I was, found myself living in Washington, DC, you know, lobbying for, uh, for a government loan for mm -hmm. the next three months. Crash course. Yeah. And how did you communicate? So you had a lot of communications with, with the government the months that followed. How did you think about the various communications to the public, to customers, employees, shareholders? Yeah, we, well, we tried to make them think everything was OK. Yeah. Um, and even though we weren't quite sure it was, we were honest. But um, let everybody know that we were, we were going to get this done, even though we weren't certain we were. Um, so the communication was. Um, was uh, uh, anyway, it, it was it was communication was important, but the real important part was trying to get through this, um, uh, get through the loan process. Is by the way, there's, is I'm going to embarrass somebody. Is Marlena Slowick in here? Hi, her father John Slowick was our investment banker through all this, so he he uh, he, he lived through this with me. Um, so anyway, I, you nice to see you. Thanks. <laughs> Tell your dad hi. Um, so anyway, he and I went through a lot together. But yeah. so look, you didn't ask. I, I, I want to give you one quick story, which I think can help pull this together and also this career stuff. Because um, C and Marlena reminded me of this. Look, we went through this process and almost, uh, and we were told um, by the government, no. Uh, mm -hmm. We were told this, you know, Marlena's father and I sat there and got, you know, had the. Department of, the Department of the Treasury sent us a fax, you know, at City's Government Affairs Office Friday at 5 p.m. so they could then leave. Yeah. Um, that said, you know, we've reviewed your file and, and, and um, need to tell you that you're, we cannot approve your application at this time, which is you know, it's no. So and it's, it's the worst day of my life. Um, we were going to liquidate. And I didn't know what we were going to do about it. Um, I just, and again, from this time now, so it's now, I'm, I'm the CEO of this airline. I've been CEO, this is now, this is now November, October, November. So I've been CEO Very for two months. Yeah, point. exactly. So I'm thinking, so I, I just can't help but think, this, this didn't turn out right. Um, my career, you know, I'm going I'm sure to be the worst CEO of all time. <clears throat> I was CEO over two months. We liquidated the company. What am I going to do? What am I, and all this kind of me, me, me stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, which, again, is, I, I don't feel badly about that. That's natural. I mean, you'll get into jobs and you kind of worry about your career. And I was still worried about my career and what I was going to do. And here I knew I was going to be at this company that was, gonna, that was going to liquidate. So um, and here's the, here's the career story. So I go and um, on that flight home from, from DC to Phoenix, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, DC to Phoenix, I always get up and talk to our team and crew because it's important and I, and I learn from them. But I didn't want to go talk to the flight attendant crew on the flight because I knew everyone, this was you know, front page news, no one knew yet about this letter. Um, but everyone was asking, so I knew they were going to ask and I knew I couldn't lie to her, to the flight attendants, but I also didn't. So I was contemplated just spinning this four hours in my seat. But then I said, I can't do that. I got to get up. So I go back and talk and um, I'm glad I did. Uh, this flight attendant in the back asking what's going on. Uh, I tell her, well, gee, it doesn't look too good right now. Um, you know, I just, it's, we're fighting through it, but I just, I don't feel good about it. And she says, well, what's that going to mean? I said, well, look, if we can't get this done, you know, we'll file bankruptcy and we'll try and hang on, but I don't feel good about that either. And she just looks at me and says, you can't do that. I'm, I'm, I've been doing this job for 10 years. I'm a single mom. I've got my life arranged around this flight attendant job. Um, I can't do anything else. I'm really good at it, which, by the way, she was, because I'd seen her. Um, and you just can't let that happen. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, OK. Um, but no, it was really helpful. So I went back, sat in my seat, pulled out the damn letter again, and, and realized that it said, at this time. 
can't approve it this time. So, okay, we, you know, I landed that night. Uh, we went straight to work. We worked all weekend. We showed back up in DC Monday morning, uh, John with us, um, with a new application. And these guys at the Treasury said, what are you doing here? <laughs> I said, you said not at this time. Here's another application. We're not going away. Um, and we kept fighting. And we didn't give up. And, I, we didn't, and, and so anyway, from that time, um, you know, that, that airline, that little American West Airline, had to have that loan. Um, that little airline, American West Airlines, lived off of wage advantages. Um, other airlines went through bankruptcy and got their wages down to ours. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, we had a new problem, which was we didn't have the revenue generating capability they did, but they had the same cost structure as us now. That airline wasn't going to work. So we had to do a merger. So we merged with US Airways. Um, and then the US Airways ended up essentially the same kind of problem. So we did a merger with American. All those things, um, none of those was, a, from the time of that encounter, did I, was I spending time thinking what's best for my career? Mm -hmm. Every one of them was, I, I'm responsible for these hardworking people who, if we don't do our jobs right, aren't going to have a job. And it's not their fault. They're, she, these people are fantastic. They're depending upon us to make sure that we put the company into a position where they don't have to worry about whether or not the company's going to be there for them. So the reason we worked so hard for those mergers and the reason I personally worked so hard on it was not because we wanted to get ourselves in a position of being... CEO of the largest airline in the world is because that was the only way to get that group of people in a safe harbor. Anyway, so the moral of this story is from the, the, from the time I stopped thinking about my career, about my career, and started thinking about doing my job um, for a bigger cause, my career took off. <laughs> um, and so anyway, I like that part. So my message of this is <laughs> if you, it's hard to do. <clears throat> you know, I, 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 you always hear people say, oh, go do what you love. To which I thought, that's BS. I, I love playing basketball, but I. <laughs> <clears throat> Nobody's going to pay me to do that. So, um, but, but I think that, that but what really is true, if you can figure out a way to make what you do uh, be bigger than just you, um, that, that'll work out really well for you. And, and again, it's not that easy. It's, it's, it's a lot like saying, do what you love. Um, but if you, if you can find a way, once you find that, don't let go of it. Um, because that is, that's, how, that's when things really start happening. Um, when, you, when, you, when you're not just, because look, if it, if it had been me, if I'd have been worried about, oh gee, I want to be CEO of American Airlines, um, some point during this whole fight, I would have said, well, CEO of US Airways isn't that bad. Um, I'm fine, you know, I'm, I'm going to be fine. I want to move, this is okay. But that never crossed our minds because this was no, no, no. We got to get this done um, for all these people that are counting on us. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm glad you bring up the mergers because I wanted to ask uh, before we <laughs> talk about the success of the U.S. Airways American merger about what you learned from the failed attempts to merge with United and Continental. Yeah, they weren't failures. Um, oh, good. I'm already learning. You're reading it upside down again. <laughs> uh, and uh, look, this, this, is, this is back to the risk thing. And of course, they, this is you know, perceived as failures. But it's exactly what I'm really glad we did it. Um, we were, uh, the first one that Gracie is referring to was shortly after doing the America West US Airways merger. Um, and we hadn't, we, and we were kind of, this, we were actually shorter than this part. We were just one year into it. Uh, Delta Airlines was in bankruptcy. They were trying, they were about to emerge in bankruptcy. Um, we came up with the great idea of bringing them out of bankruptcy with a merger with the then U.S. Airways, which hadn't really even merged with America West very well yet. Um, but it was a good idea. Um, it would have been a really good airline. Um, and the Delta team didn't like it, so it turned into a hostel, <clears throat> um, which doesn't happen very often, hostels of companies in bankruptcy. But we tried it. Um, we knew going in it was high risk and probably and more likely than not not to work, but you know, it was... It was the rolling the six on the die. Huge upside, <clears throat> if it worked, excuse me. Um, and if it didn't work, it didn't work. So, um, and also if it didn't work, what we knew is we were going to, um, they would have to figure out something else to do. Uh, and they did. What happened is, so long story short, that, that group of people, when you're in bankruptcy, you don't have a board, you have creditors. Well, you have a board, but the people running the company are the people that you, that you stiffed. Um, so the people that they owe money that aren't getting paid are now in control of the company. <clears throat> and those people, um, you know, who we were appealing to by saying, look, you'll get much more of your money back if you do this with us than with them, um, you know, kind of believed us, but at the end said, look, we're going we're gonna to stick with them. But they insisted that that board be changed, um, that that board put people on that were pro-consolidation. 
um, including Richard Anderson, who now runs the place. Um, and shortly after the merger, um, that Northwest went and did a, Delta went and did a merger with Northwest. I don't think that would have happened if we hadn't done the hostel. And if Delta hadn't merged with Northwest, um, United wouldn't have been, our next one then, our next, our next aborted attempt um, that we failed at was um, trying to then, after that happened, uh, merge US Airways and United. Yeah. Um, and we got pretty close there. Uh, but United eventually told us no and picked Continental instead. So United merged Continental. Another thing that wouldn't have happened had we not tried to get the first one done. So anyway, I was being flippant with you saying we, we didn't fail. We, from the outside, those are failures. Yeah. Uh, and that's what they expected my point. Um, I don't feel badly about them at all. Mm -hmm. um, and people would write at the time, oh, gee, you know, again, pointing it all on me, Doug failed at this merger attempt. But it was going, it, did exa it, did, it didn't do exactly what we wanted. We wanted them both to work. Right. But it, it progressed us to where we could do what we needed to do, and it moved the industry where it needed to move. Mm -hmm. And there was no one else out there, you know, trying to make that happen. I don't know where we'd be if we hadn't tried to do those things. And so with American, I think one of the re reasons it was so successful was you built this strong relationship with the labor unions. Can you talk about the <coughs> traits and, and what about you as a leader made those relationships so successful? Well, again, not all me. Um, a really good team of people who, um, you know, who we who cared about um, so much about taking care of our team mm -hmm. um, that we knew that we could do so much for them that we also knew it was going to be best for the employees of American. Um, so we did the um, rather non-traditional step of while American was in bankruptcy, um, beginning negotiate. We were, so Americans in bankruptcy were were at U.S. Airways. We started negotiating with the American Airlines unions um, for a contract that we would be willing to sign if indeed a merger got done. These people didn't work for us. <laughs> they were for American, um, and we're meeting with them in Phoenix and signing contracts with them. Um, which look, I didn't do lightly. It was. It was um, I know it offended my friends in America that we were meeting with their employees. Um, but it was, again, we had to get this done for our team. It was the right thing to do. So um, to your point, um, we recognized, and we learned it in the Delta transaction, frankly. We, we did have the creditors on board in the Delta transaction. Uh, what we didn't get was the employees on board. Um, they were very proud of Delta. They wanted to stay with Delta, and that hurt us. Um, so we recognized we needed, to get, we, need, we needed to get the team on board. So we approached Americans' employees. Um, we told them, we laid out for them what we planned to do. Uh, we told them why we thought it was better. They agreed, um, and it wouldn't have gotten done without them. So it, was, it, was, it worked out well. And, and now that the, the merger is successful, there's, you're the CEO of the largest airline in the world, 120,000 employees around the globe. You're also the father of three. Yes. How does being a CEO compare to being a father? <laughs> <coughs> Father's a lot harder. Um, I don't know. Like I have great kids. I try really hard to... Um, to be a, uh, a father more than a CEO. Um, my job, I probably spend more hours at CEO, unfortunately. <clears throat> but um, uh, frankly, I learned so much from being a father that I can use at work. <clears throat> um, which, anyway, it's, you know, raising children is this amazing thing. That's, everybody does it at some point, so it's not like I'm I'm an expert here, um, but you just, just watching the development and watching how people interact and watching how your kids interact helps me a lot to understand and, and to actually go manage the company. Um, so I've learned a lot more about, I've, I've become a better CEO because I'm a father. Um, I try really hard um, to be a good father as well. I, you know, I do things to make sure that I'm home as much as I can be. This is, this is a rarity for me where I, you know, just where I'm out of town for a night and it's not required work, but I wanted to do it. Um, well, I wanted to do it for George. Um, but, um, and I appreciate it as well. But the, um, uh, so, I, so I try and stay home as much as I can. Um, my job requires me to travel. I refuse to do, refuse. I almost never do work dinners in Dallas. Um, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna be home, I'm gonna be have, I'm gonna have a meal with my kids. Um, if somebody wants to meet with me, of course, that's important to the company. We can do it at lunch or breakfast. Um, or we can do it in my office, but there's no reason for me to be going to a dinner in Dallas. Um, so I have rules like that that I just make sure that I stay engaged, stay balanced. When you moved to Dallas after the, the acquisition, was that a, a family conversation about how you balance where, where the kids have been raised versus where you're doing work? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
You're good at this. Um, <laughs> so, uh, do you want to hear the story? I do. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it was horrible. I said the worst day of my life was uh, that day that I got the letter. This might have been the worst day of my life. This is this is a really hard day. You know, my kids. We we. Um, my eldest, who's 20, uh, was born in Minneapolis when I was at Northwest, but we moved when he was three weeks old. And the other two were born in Phoenix. Um, and that's where they were raised. And um, so they didn't, you know, and this, you know, this merger was in the papers all the time. And, you know, I had one day my daughter, who at the time, I guess, was, she's 15 now, so she was 13, um, sends me a text and says, you know, Mrs. Roswell told me the merger is going through. <laughs> it's Thanks, like, Mrs. Roswell. Mrs. Roswell is a friend of a friend. <laughs> I just like, well, I will know before Mrs. Roswell. Um, <laughs> and I promise I'll tell you. But you know, because the, mer the things would happen, like you know, a rumor would, you know, that yeah. you know, we we got a deal done with the unions, and that's okay. The merger's gone through is the way it gets reported. So all of a sudden, my kids are just going crazy. Um, so anyway, they didn't want to move, um, but. Uh, so anyway, the bad part was when we finally did to do it, and I'd been telling them all along, quit listening to everybody else. I'll, when, I, when I tell you, it's when it's happening. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about it until then. So they at least had some comfort in that. And then one day I had to come home and grab them and say, hey, I need to talk to you. And, we, and as soon as my daughter walked in, she, I said, hey, I need to talk to you, and pulled her. And we'd already had the two boys and my wife there. And she walked in the room and just saw that they were there and just started sobbing. So aren't you glad you made me tell that story? Uh, it's all right. Um, so no, it was really, really. It's but look, that's stuff you got to do. She's fantastic. She's fine now. She wouldn't. She wouldn't leave Dallas. So mm -hmm. it's all fine. But yeah, I mean that's it was. Uh, that was a, that was that was the bad part of doing this. So I, I did, we we were like, and again it gets back to look if we were just doing this for ourselves, we just stayed where we were. We were perfectly fine and happy. Yeah. But you got to do what's right for the organization. And now that you're at this point, the the merger, the final pieces have come together. Hopefully, friends have been made in Dallas. What's next for American as a company, and what's next for you as CEO? Um, well, look, we're, we are we are uh, set an objective of ourselves of becoming the greatest airline in the world, and we're not there yet. So, uh, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, we spent the last two years integrating, which is uh, sounds boring, and it is, um, <laughs> but it's really hard work, yeah. and it takes a lot of time and effort. And our team has just knocked the ball out of the park. Um, but now we've gotten we've gotten through the vast majority of that. We still have some left. Um, and now we really need to go start producing now that we are working as one airline. Um, and we know what we need to do. Our, our objective is to be the, the best in the world. And you know that, that's a somewhat nebulous term. But I, we know we're not it now. So that at least we know we have to make some progress. But what it, what it certainly means is you got to be an airline that people want to fly. Uh, you have to be an airline where people want to work. And you have to be an airline where people, where investors want to put their money. Um, and you know we're doing okay on each of those, but we can do a lot better on each, and we're not the best at any of them. Mm -hmm. And we want to be the best at all of them. So uh, we're going to make huge improvements to the product. It's already begun. Um, that includes the operational reliability issues that you mentioned, um, but it also includes um, you know a, a entire modernization of the fleet, brand new airplanes. We now have the youngest fleet in the world, uh, or in the United States. Uh, we have um, uh, that includes. Um, uh, you know, Wi-Fi through all of our airplanes, including international, Wi-Fi flat seats international, taking our Admirals clubs to look like, you know, the kind of clubs you'd see when you fly internationally, not just when you fly in the United States. So making it a true global airline with a real global product. So we have a lot of work to do, um, and we have a lot of work to do with our team. Uh, there's a lot of history in American Airlines um, of management labor relations that are just horrible. Um, I'm not trying to say anything bad about prior management. They, they had really difficult situation to go through. But it re the result was a really, really bad um, history uh, that's hard for people to let go of. Yeah. And so we're trying, to, we're trying to convince people that that's over and this is new. And we try and figure out ways to do that every day, just surprise people with something to say, wow, that's different. Um, yeah. This feels different. So we got a lot of work to do with our team, too. But, and, and by the way, it's incredibly important to the first one. Um, the, this, the airline business is, is so much about the employees that you interact with uh, and their attitudes. So if we can get our employees to be excited about being where they are, uh, our customers will be much happier um, on the airplane. And that'll help us drive uh, more passengers to the airline. And that'll help us meet our goals of getting a return for our investors. So it starts with the employees. A lot of exciting work ahead. Thanks. Excellent. I'd like to open up to the audience now for questions. I think our <coughs> first one is from Twitter. So thanks both for a, a wonderful conversation. Um, so the first question from Twitter comes from a chap called Jake, 
who says that the, um, the Economist wrote that airlines are wonderful generators of profit for everyone except themselves. Uh, how do you envisage changing that, especially with headwinds such as climate change and so forth? Yeah, that's, um, that, that was true from, you know, the, the beginning of time until recently. We real, look, we're, this, this airline, this business is transformed. Um, and I believe that um, uh, is, is, as much as I can believe, is, as much as I can possibly stress, no one, no, not no one, very few others seem to believe it. Um, you know, our, the market doesn't believe it. Um, as you can see with the way, you know, our stock is trading versus um, what we're looking at in terms of earnings. Um, it's hard for our employees to believe it. Uh, it's hard for the management team to believe it. But this, and, and it's obviously hard for the economists to believe it. So, but look, this, this is a real business now. We're producing real returns. And we've got a business now that it's still a cyclical business. Uh, people's, people will, you know, fly less in bad times and fly more in good times. But um, we're, we're, we're producing profits now that are in line with general industry, actually a little ahead of them. Um, and, uh, you know, peaks, you know, double um, the highest earnings the industry has ever produced, uh, even though we're not, hopefully not at peak margins right now. Uh, so I think the industry has been largely transformed, mostly due to this, largely due to the consolidation that we discussed. So I don't. I, I, that's that's what we needed to do. The the problem with the world before, where everyone else made money and we didn't. All of our suppliers made money. Boeing made money. That's by the way how America West and others stayed around because um, those who who lived off of our off of our carcass um, needed us to to be around for a little more. So they'd loan us money to keep us kicking around. Um, you know I I I. I um, on three occasions, uh, received loans from either GE or Airbus uh, to save a company from going bankruptcy, going into bankruptcy. America West and U.S. Airways. Um, so, but we don't. No one talks about that anymore. We're not, we're not even kind of doing that. We're not raising. You know, we're, we raised last week a billion dollars of aircraft financing at below four percent. Um, so this is uh, anyway. The answer to that question, if you'd asked me five years ago or ten years ago, was we've got to get consolidation done because the industry is too fragmented and we can't provide the uh, we can't provide to consumers what they want, uh, which is the ability to you know have one airline take them everywhere they want to go. And as a result, we all end up trying to do that, and we are incredibly inefficient. Um, so anyway, I, I think we're past it. A lot of questions. There's mics going around. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for coming. Sure. Uh, really appreciated your remarks on teamwork. It made me think right away of one of your agents in uh, Raleigh. Her name is Tammy Fields. We fly a ton, and she has basically adopted our family. She keeps an eye on like award seat searches that we're trying to do to Tokyo or somewhere and calls me up when something comes through. Just so far above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, we were stranded one time in Peru. It was Tammy that got us out of the fix and got us flights and you know pulled whatever strings needed to be pulled. Really the kind of success story you're looking for. I'd like to give you her name when you're finished, if that's OK. I got it, and I see my colleague down there typing it into his iPhone. So we got it. <laughs> Tammy, Tammy Fields, Fields in, in Raleigh. Raleigh. We will definitely let her know. Tammy Fields in Raleigh. Thank you for telling me. We, have, we do. We have a phenomenal group of people like this. Thanks for telling me. Hi. Um, Hi. I wanted to ask about how you keep uh, loyal customers, given the recent uh, award program devaluations among your competitors, United and Delta, and Americans' uh, impending award devaluation on March 22nd. How do you uh, look at customer loyalty and uh, maintain you know, their trust in their business? Yeah, thanks. Um, we don't view it as devaluation. We view it as a change. Um, and. And it, 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 look, it is. I mean, this, these programs, um, you know, when they were established, for whatever reason, uh, they were established as, um, you know, you you earn. We measured loyalty by how many miles you fly, um, and that's one way to do it. Um, but we don't, you know, we don't uh, we don't report our P and L as miles flown minus expenses. It's revenues minus expenses. And you know, what's more important, and what we want to stimulate, what we want to reward. Um, it, you know, for most people, miles flown and revenues are, are, are a reasonable approximation. But with that model, you had these very, very odd um, things we created. Um, people doing, paying, you know, very find the lowest possible fare they could find, um, and fly, and spending their weekends flying around on the lowest fares they could find so that they could get free travel um, somewhere else. That's and. It, 
look, we love those people. I'm not trying. Those are customers of ours. But, but, when they, but when that happens, what we as an airline are choosing to do is give that individual the first class seat um, to Paris instead of the individual who, who didn't fly as many miles and actually spend his time at his weekends at home, um, but during the week paid full fare. Um, and that doesn't, that's not the right model. So it's a shift in the model. It's, it's one of these things, again, where it's a transformation. So everyone that grew up in that old model says that you're, you're making this worse for me. Um, but we're not making it worse for everyone. It's, it's worse for some. It's better for others. Um, and I think, it's, I, think it's, it's, I think it's more fair and more equitable. And it's rewarding what we want to reward, uh, which is those people who fly us you know, the, you know, in, in who pay the most um, and who, 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 who you know, purchase the fares um, that, you know, are, are, you know, not just going around and trying to find, you know, $100 fares, transcons on a weekend to figure out how to get more miles. So again, that's, that, it's great they do that. that we, we encouraged that by the, by the model we had. That's, that we, we need, we'd like to actually uh, have those seats for the people that are, that are producing the, the most revenue for us. Um, hello, to uh, Tobias from Germany. I would like to talk about technology because I haven't heard this at all today. I mean, mm -hmm. I remember like 15 years ago, um, I was reading somewhere internet in the planes. I got very excited. I was very addictive to internet back then. And then it took 15 years until at least in Europe, it was most of the airplanes available. And even now, I mean, EasyJet, Ryanair, I mean, Lufthansa just started. It took like 15 years until people were able to use internet. In the US, it was a bit earlier, but it was still taking a long time. So my question is like how in the future you can guarantee the technology is being integrated much earlier into airplanes, especially in regards of customer experience. Because, I mean, I would love to have already an American Airlines app where I could upgrade myself during a plane, maybe for a special price on business class, where I maybe could skip the line if it's, it's or maybe get fast boarding because there's now a huge queue and I feel like I'm just tired. I mean, I really feel like the customer experience, which a lot of online companies are offering and the mobile technologies out there, has arrived at the airplane air, airlines. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, no, look, we're, we are, uh, we're moving as fast as we possibly can and because of, because of um, customer demand, uh, because of people like you who are insisting. Uh, the, the, the reality is Wi-Fi uh, on aircraft, you know, that you talked about, um, there, you know, I, I remember us sitting around and debating it and, you know, geez, it's, there's no way it can possibly pay for itself. We've got to carry this stuff around. You know, this, this is... These are antennas that communicate down to cell towers, and they're really expensive, and um, and they're heavy, and you know people got you know there's no way we're gonna have people pay for it. Um, but the once it was on the airplane on a few um, customers started saying this airplane doesn't have Wi-Fi anymore, so there was no choice um, because you, because we needed to have it, and then it came really really quickly. Um, so I don't think that was I don't know if that was so much technology as maybe. Um, um, resistance from um, airlines to, to go do something that, that, that we couldn't cost justify. Um, but um, that's all behind us now. I and mean, this, this, is, this is going so fast. We're all trying to figure out how to leapfrog somebody else. Um, as it relates to um, you know, some of the things you're talking about, we, we, we are, we're, we're working um, diligently to figure out everything we can to make sure the customer experience can be done um, as, as much through technology as possible. Some of the things you described we simply can't do because you know, the, because of the regulations we have to live with. Um, you know, I, I, I can tell you right now, if um, you know the way I travel and the way probably most of you travel, there's no reason for me to to see um, an individual until I get on the airplane. There's no reason to have an interaction with, or even to see an American Airlines employee. Because I'm not checking a bag, um, and I've got my boarding pass, my iPhone, and I hand it to someone who then puts it under the thing, and I, I can do that. Um, so, but we we we're not allowed to not have an agent stand there and just let an individual decide that they're going to get in the airplane. So some of this is um, some of this is just requirements that we we're always going to have, uh, but we can do a lot better, and we're we're working really hard at. It. Uh, I can tell you, American Airlines, as it relates to this, um, we now have. Um, we're putting uh, internet onto our international flights. Um, it's not on all of them yet, but we're we're way ahead of the we're way ahead of the game there. So transatlantic transit things you couldn't do before because now we're now we're now we're shooting up satellites um, instead of going down to cell towers. And with that technology, that was that's new technology. Now we can actually 
provide um, Wi-Fi service anywhere on the anywhere in the air. So uh, we're moving to that as quickly as we can. Uh, so we'll keep working on it, but we agree with you. I'm afraid I'm going to take the last question for myself, uh, which thanks, which is you earned it. <laughs> thank you. I've tried. Yeah. What advice do you have for the MBAs in the room? If you could go back and it's your time at Owen, what do you wish you could tell yourself? Um, well, uh, well, anyway, the, uh, again, so many of you are going to go off and live in your basements, so I'm not sure what to tell you about, uh, <laughs> about how to do that. Um, you're, you're smarter than I am. But the, uh, what I can tell you is what I do know, um, at least from a more traditional perspective, where you go show up at a job, um, is um, you know, I, I, was, I was honored uh, do this part of the introduction to have this uh, the relationships matter piece uh, mentioned. Um, that, that's what I think. Uh, what I believe is, and what, and what I would what I what I would encourage. What I what the, the reason was I was talking to a group like this, and what I told them is, look, you know, I, the, what I have learned in my career um, that it's I know it's taught in business schools, and it seems so matter of fact that why do you even teach it? Um, but you can't stress it enough is how important. Um, relationships are um, and how you treat people in your relative success and you know this uh, there's this there's this perception of among some you know outside of business that business is is this you know the way you get ahead is you know backstabbing cutthroat that doesn't, doesn't work at all um, it absolutely I mean it work for a short period of time but you'll be you'll be done um, and you'll go need to find another job before too long uh, in another industry, because it doesn't work. Uh, what matters is uh, people that, in every relationship they have, you treat people with respect and dignity, and you um, you you with uh, and you show up and do your job well. And what I, what I don't think what I, what I watch people, I don't think they fully appreciate it, is from the time you walk in the door, um, that starts, and you're building relationships with people, and you're not you don't have any idea. Um, you can't possibly decide, oh, that person's somebody I really need to have a relationship, and that person's not. Um, that's what I've learned through all this crazy story of all the stuff I've been through. I mean, this American Airlines, US Airways merger, we ended up with people in part of this process that helped us out um, that you know, said, oh, yeah, 15 years ago, you know, you, we worked on this project. And, and you know, at that time, there's no way we would have thought that individual was going to be representing you know, the flight attendants who were really important to us at the time. Uh, but thank goodness we treated that person well 15 years ago. Um, and if we hadn't, and they hadn't been treated maybe so well from the, from the other side, it made a huge difference. Uh, so anyway, the message is this. You're going to, from the day you walk in the door, you're going to start those relationships. And people are, and, you, and, and if, if you try and say, oh, I'm, I'm, I care about that person, not that person, that's not going to work. So treat everybody the same. Treat everybody. And if you do that, um, you will just, the people that do that versus those who don't. Um, do dramatically better. And I think that's, that's the biggest key as anything. So, you know, give somebody the same intellect, energy, uh, integrity, all that, um, but, you know, not the ability to, to, uh, to build relationships with somebody who can, and they're going to have dramatically different careers. So um, that would be my advice. Just be nice to people. <laughs> that's great advice. Thanks. Thank you so much, Doug. Right. It's been Thank amazing. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.